Hey guys, welcome to the Physique Development Podcast. In today's episode, we are going to go over progress and how to gauge your progress. And I know the number one thing people use to gauge progress is often the scale. And that can be a really, 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 really helpful tool in the toolbox, but it's just one part of the toolbox. And we need to be smart about the way that we use that tool because we don't want to dole that tool over time and then not be able to get the benefit out of it. And Actually, fun fact, a lot of my clients don't even weigh themselves. We found that it was giving more harm than good and where their headspace was at, as well as where their goals were at. So we're going to dive in some different ways that you can gauge progress, including the scale, but definitely not stopping with the scale. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it on over to Alex. Perfect. So <clears throat> when we look at, at progress, we have a lot of tools for us to analyze and things that are going to be more valuable to us than just the scale itself. If we look at when we're uh, assessing progress, the scale is going to be just a small fraction of that progress in and of itself. So measurements are going to be very helpful. Measurements are something that we would advise to uh, take maybe on a month to month basis. It's not something you're going to see change in probably from a week to week standpoint, but from a, a month to month perspective, you're going to have better likelihood of, of changes on on that front. Pictures are going to be huge. Now, you could see week to week progress from a picture standpoint, but again, this is one that you're going to want to compare maybe on a month to month basis or uh, every eight weeks. I think that pics are a, a huge piece of the puzzle when we're looking at uh, simple progress there. And then we have a lot of biofeedback markers that we can assess as well um, within our digestion, our sleep, our, our strength, our energy. A lot of those different things are um, big pieces that are very important. And honestly, all the things that I have outlined here, and we've got other ones that we're going to dig into are more important than the scale. Like if you having better energy, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm sure that you would say yes to having that over seeing one pound less on the scale and having potentially worse energy or, or what have you. So I think that being able to look at it from a full picture standpoint is going to be extremely important when you're in assessing progress. Um, and I'm excited to dig into that with you guys today. Yeah, and with talking about the scale, it also depends on what your goal is in the moment. And I think that's an important point to bring up because I think that at least the clients that I interact with or the people that I interact with a lot end up just looking at the scale and always wanting it to go down regardless of what their goal is. And being able to have a real expectation and effort and understanding what the steps are to get to that goal is going to be extremely important. So if your goal is to gain muscle, then we're not looking at the scale to just continuously be going down. So being able to understand the metric of the scale to be able Able to use it. Because yeah, if you're in a contest prep or if you're in a dieting phase, we want that number to go down. But there's also times that we'll see that number stay the same and we'll still be making progress forward because we take a look at the bigger picture. Yeah, I think I have, you know, it's, it's like split half and half. You know, these aren't the most accurate statistics, but like I would say half and half or at least a 60-40 split of people who I've helped sort of recomp or go through a fat loss phase that end up coming out the other side leaner, much happier with their physique, stronger, more energy, you name it. And they're the same weight or slightly heavier on the scale than they were coming in. Right. And I think that is a true attest obviously to not only the condition you were in, the type of training you were doing, the intensity you brought to the equation, the ultimate goal of what we're trying to accomplish and all of that stuff uh, as well. But Again, like it's not just as these guys have, have talked about, it's not just about that scale going down or um, what have you, you know, there's other, there's other metrics, you know, measurements, biofeedback markers, uh, energy levels, performance, recovery, sleep, stress, you name it, um, that we're gauging. And so just having your, your scope pointed towards the scale is a very short-sighted view of the entire equation. And it's one that if not regulated uh, psychologically or emotionally, will absolutely psych you out of the progress that you are making and have you making decisions that you otherwise shouldn't be making uh, in that moment just because you want to have, let's say one out of 10 really important metrics not moving, but the other nine are, but you're not looking at those. Right, so success lies in the metrics you're tracking. And if you're only tracking the one, you could be unsuccessful in that one, but that doesn't mean you're unsuccessful as a whole 
when looking at your goal. Yeah. And I love that you brought up the psychological side of the scale because I'll give an example here in a second. But this is where having a goal weight can actually stop you from reaching what your goals are because you get so trapped into this number and you're only looking at that, that you're not taking into consideration the other variables, the other metrics. And then it can cause you to fight for that number and be so focused to get there that by the time you get there, whether it's up or down or all around, that you're not happy with how you look because you were chasing that number. So when we are about to dive into biofeedback and talking about all the markers we look at as coaches and ones that we highly encourage you to take a look at and to really audit yourself um, and to check in with yourself, or if you want to have a physique development coach help you, then inquire below. But being able to look at the different metrics and really be able to build together, okay, what does this mean for me and the result that I want to see? So what I personally do when I have my check-ins with my coach, Alex, I will fill out my check-in sheet before I weigh myself, before I take pictures to really make sure that I'm just filling it out as honest and unemotional, so to speak, as I can, because I'm really looking at the metrics. I'm looking at how um, I am rating these questions because what I found was sometimes I would feel really good and then I would take check-in pictures or step on the scale and then immediately my check-in would turn negative for no reason other than I am a human with emotions and again that psychological point of the scale. So I fill out my check-in sheet before I even take pictures or step on the scale. I take pictures before I step on the scale so that I'm really able to gauge how I feel about myself and then I step on the scale. And the reason for this, I'll give an example from just the other day, is I stepped, I looked in the mirror, I felt really good about how I looked, and I stepped on the scale, and it was the highest number that I've seen in the past few weeks. And that was really important for me because I was able to feel confident and feel good about my physique before I stepped on that scale. When I did step on it, I was able to kind of have an internal conversation and not rationalize, but understand that that wasn't going to be the end-all be-all of how I felt about myself that day or the end-all be-all of what that metric was saying. So being able to know what goes into the scale weight of, okay, if I had a bad night of sleep, if I ate too close to bed, if I trained really hard yesterday or trained really close to bed or a multitude of other reasons, I'm able to see, hey, I felt great about my physique. So this number is just one other thing that I'm going to take into consideration instead of being down on myself the rest of the day because that number was higher than it had been in the past. 100%. I think that um, I have a, a real life example as well from uh, yesterday that uh, a client who has had a tremendous success over the last three months, she's been able to add, I think, two inches to her glutes over a, an 11 week period, which is insane. insane. And then also her waist has come down, um, a little over an inch and a half. And so it's, it's been tremendous strides over the first three months. And with the scale over that three month period, there's only been a three pound shift downward. And, um, within this, her goal was to lose body fat and, and really the, the goal as a whole within her calorie allotment, when she got started with us, it was more body recomp focus, but in her mind, she she wanted to see more fat loss. And so even with all those incredible uh, achievements within her strength and within the muscle acquisition that she's had, she still was down on herself from a scale perspective. And when I was able to, to zoom out for her and walk through all the things that she's been able to accomplish over that three month period that had nothing to do with the scale and all the success outside of it, uh, she was able to really uh, understand the successes that she's had and be so much more proud of herself and not as down because she was so honed in on that single variable and so zoomed in and not seeing the full picture that oftentimes the tools that we're about to speak on uh, really allow for you to be in a much more positive light as well as um, understand more of what's going on with your body. And I think that that's one of the greatest things that we do from a coaching standpoint is that when clients leave working with us, they have a much better grasp of what's really dictating what's going on within their physique, what's dictating their progress within their body composition and those different factors. And that's something that I'm abundantly proud of because it's not just the success that you're having in your time working with us, but the success that you have past your time still utilizing the tools that we've taught uh, in our time working together. So uh, let's go ahead and, and dig into the, the variables. 
Yeah. So when we're looking at some, we've listed them out here, but being able to look at sleep quality and quantity. And the reason that this is going to be a good marker to look at when it comes to progress is we always want to relate these back to what your goal is, as well as what your starting point or what your baseline is. So if you've had really poor sleep and sleep is improving and the scale isn't changing, um, that's still progress that we're seeing moving forward. So if your sleep quality Quality or quantity is improving, um, or just how you're feeling as you sleep, like you wake up feeling more rested, or it's easier to fall asleep. These are all really great signs. And I feel like within biofeedback, people diminish or belittle themselves or belittle what progress that they've made, because it's kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, I got better sleep, but like the scale didn't change, or I wasn't able to fit into a smaller pair of clothes. Um, and so being able to really take this into consideration when we're looking at not only the big picture, but the reason for the big picture is our health at the core of this. And we're trying to improve health markers. Of course, we want to improve aesthetics, and that can always be a goal of yours. And I think we've made that extremely clear at Physique Development. We're pro having an aesthetic goal, but we're also very pro health and how you're able to have a better quality of life. So sleep is going to be a huge thing to be able to use as that marker, but it can also go the opposite way. So if you realize you're not having as great sleep, being able to nail down what factors are playing into that, that might be stopping you because sleep is so important when it comes to seeing progress, whether it is muscle gain or it's fat loss or it's maintenance, or you just want to be really, really good at your job, sleep is going to be huge for this. And so we do have a video that will, if it's already out, I'll have it linked below. If it's not, then keep an eye out talking about how you can become elite when it comes to sleep and really being able to nail down those metrics going into sleep so that you're able to see that progress you want to moving forward and even use sleep as a progress metric that you are seeing. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. Yeah, I think that Austin and I can speak to the aspect of really crappy sleep and how that impacts progress <laughs> pretty uh, thoroughly uh, because Austin, more so than myself, has had a rough road from a, a sleep standpoint. Mine's more so been the last couple of years uh, myself. But I, I will say that the things that I notice within myself as well as our clients is that um, – my like blemishes and, and acne are probably the thing that are dictated the most by my sleep. The better my sleep is, the better my skin is, the, the smoother my skin is, those different things. And then also when you're not sleeping, you're going to have a greater allotment of, of fluid retention and just stress on the body in general. So when you're looking at physique photos, uh, you're going to be uh, you know probably a little upset and, and that's going to more so be rooted in the, the sleep component of things. One thing that I uh, teach with our clients is that it's the lack of sleep goggles. It puts everything kind of in a negative perspective in my eyes. And so that's one thing that we really drive home with them is that, hey, you've got the you've got the the lack of sleep goggles on. Let's get some good sleep and let's reevaluate where things are at before we get too um, too rushed and, and try to make adjustments and things like that. What are some of the things that you've noticed uh, for you, Austin, from a, a body composition standpoint or just how you feel when your your sleep is shit? <laughs> oh man. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've had a rough go at it and, you know, regardless of your, your knowledge and, you know, what you do for a living. So right. As a health professional, it doesn't mean you're exempt from problems around surrounding health. Right. And there's a lot of things from an environment standpoint, a psychological standpoint, emotional standpoint, physical standpoint that will, uh, impact your sleep uh, negatively or positively, but more negatively uh, in my case over the past few years. And it's, you know, it put me in a position, the, the I, I think the biggest thing that I noticed with my more chronic sleep issues over the past few years have been my body comp changes when my actions weren't bad enough historically to dictate the change that did happen like physically from like a body comp perspective and just the way that I felt and, and carried myself through life and everything else. It was just like the rest of like, I'm eating healthy. I'm getting my, you know, macros in, I'm getting my micros in, uh, you know, I'm not over abusing caffeine. 
I won't be dishonest and say that I wasn't <laughs> probably maybe slightly overusing it, but not so much that it would do what that did for so long, right? And from a body compass perspective, that was probably the biggest thing, right? And shifts from, so when we talk about body comp, right, it's it's usually in reference to like the shifts from your muscularity versus your body fat, right? So like lean body mass versus like your body fat levels in general, right? And how you're carrying around the, the scale weight. So, you know, I, there's, there's different looks you can have, right? So I have, I have one look that I've, I've seen at, you know, let's say 205 pounds and I have a, a, a different, I have a version two of that look at 205 pounds. Right. And there's, so there's two versions of me that, that have existed over my lifetime at 205 pounds. One of them I was stoked about the other one I was not stoked about. <laughs> and the one that I wasn't as stoked about was the one that was, um, sort of the, surmounting end result of my more chronic sleep issues, which have gotten much, much, much better over the past couple of years. And so I basically had to take a step back from any other goals that I ultimately had physically and just had to tear away everything and just say, okay, I have to focus on whatever I need to get good sleep. Right. And so for me, that's, I, I had noticed that one of the biggest issues I was having aside from just like sleep anxiety, which is horrific to deal with. Um, so basically you're, you're so exhausted and you're so tired, but you have so much anxiety around the fact that you under, you know, you're not going to sleep that night that you basically just like psych yourself out of ever sleeping. And so you just like, it's just like this, this reoccurring thing that happens every night. Um, so I had to work out of that mindset. Um, and a big thing that did help me, if you guys are people that do struggle with sleep, one thing that helped me was I just sort of just gave up control of ever falling asleep. And I just became okay with laying there and, and relaxing um, and taking the pressure away from like, you know, we've all had these like internal dialogues in our head. Like if I fall asleep now, I'll get eight hours of sleep. <laughs> yeah. If I fall asleep now, I'll get six hours of sleep. You know, and that's like the worst thing you could possibly do for your sleep, right? So um, when have you ever done that? When it's been like, man, that really helped me fall asleep. Um, it's like the opposite effect of counting sheep. So, which I don't know if you guys have ever, if you guys ever counted sheep to go to sleep. I've tried. Yeah. I don't know if I've gotten. I've tried many there. times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I used to do it more when I was, I was uh, small. Um, <laughs> I used to imagine, I don't know why I phrased it like that when I was small, uh, I'm small now. So when I was uh, younger, I guess when I was younger, I, I did that a lot more. I used to imagine myself riding a motorcycle. I don't know what that came from, but that's another one that I always imagined me doing and for some reason that helped me fall asleep. Um, so, you know, I'm at like getting wrapped up in if I fall asleep now, I'll get this many hours of sleep or what, you know, whatever pressures are kind of keeping you from that. One thing that's really helped me out is just, again, being okay with laying there and relaxing and what happens what is what's going to happen, right? So if I lay down with giving myself enough time to get a full night's rest and, you know, instead of the eight hours that I would have gotten if I fell asleep at a normal time, maybe I got five and a half right? Which is better than the two or three I was getting for 18 months leading into that point. So it's like, hey, these are small improvements, right? And the other things I noticed that really impacted that outside of the sleep anxiety itself was um, my ability to almost wear myself out physically every day. And so I was noticing that, you know, this is a, a very mentally taxing job, but not very physically taxing the online thing, like working on the internet. It's not very physically taxing. Um, and can get you can get yourself into trouble if, you, if you're not intentional with your actions throughout your days um, in terms of like body comp and, and health and everything like that. And I wasn't taking that seriously enough because I'd always been in a situation where that sort of took care of itself. And so I was sort of irresponsible with those actions. And so I had to, you know, take full ownership of that and become more responsible with my daily actions. And so uh, wearing myself out physically is one of those. So I have to, you know, I do notice, you know, I set on my Fitbit, I, my daily step threshold is always around 8,000. Um, I notice if I get under that again, it doesn't have to be like exact that, but if it's drastically under that, I'll, I always notice I have issues falling asleep. 
um, training every, you know, training most days of the week. And if I don't train in the gym, I again, usually make that up with more steps or go for, uh, like an interval based run or something like that, where I have to like truly physically wear myself out. Um, because I'll, my, I'll be mentally exhausted when I lay down, but physically I'm like sitting there, like tapping my foot and I'm just like, I'm like ready to do something, but my mind's like, bro, relax, we're done. Um, it's time to go to sleep. And so that was a weird sort of relationship that I was having with my mental exhaustion versus my physical exhaustion. And so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know where I was taking the rest no, of I that. I think that was super helpful for yeah. everybody. I'll yeah. bring it back yeah. together because I, I see it where you're okay. going. Awesome. <laughs> um, I think it's so important to see that he talked about that progress of getting two hours of sleep a night to five hours of sleep tonight and then a night and now being able to have much more restful sleep as a whole. And that is progress that he is looking at and being able to track. And as we're talking about tracking stuff, not in the way of I'm going to fall asleep now and that means I'm going to get this many hours of sleep, but roughly tracking how you're going about your day or what these metrics are that you want to improve. So as you see them improve, you know that you are making progress. So a big part of making progress is tracking progress because what gets measured gets managed. And if you're not keeping track of different metrics, then it's really hard to nail down what is causing what. And I've seen this in my own life time and time again of just being in a place where I let a few metrics kind of go. And then when I get back to like tracking them closely, I'm like, oh my gosh, I was either leaving progress on the table or I didn't realize how much I was progressing because I wasn't keeping track of these as a whole. And then it also speaks to how he knew that he had to get his sleep nailed down before he could see progress in other areas of his life. And that's a really important point when we look at all of these different metrics is not necessarily necessarily that there's an end-all priority list of every single person, this is number one, this is number two, and so on, but more of you each have a personal priority list of what needs to be nailed down and what route you need to go to address those different things as you want to see that progress going along. Um, and I think that within talking about sleep, and also talking about like movement throughout the day is phenomenal. So yesterday I had my walk in the morning and then I was running around with errands all day and I was sitting most of the day. And when I got home, I ate and I was just like, I need to go on a walk. Not because I wasn't at my step goal yet. I actually was at my step goal, not because it was programmed in or anything. I just knew where my body was at, all of that sitting, all of that mental energy like Austin talked about. I needed to move my body to feel the absolute best. Ended up helping my digestion. It helped me feel better as a whole. Um, and it allowed me to have a really restful night of sleep, which was phenomenal to be able to see. So I'm going to use Alex and have him expand as an example as he's talked about him going into this dieting phase and what he's done to really set himself up for success and what that progress looks like. Because he talked about it a little bit on his story. And if you aren't following us on Instagram, then I'll have our our, uh, Instagram handles in the show notes or in the description box. But um, if you want to go ahead and expand on what you talked about a little bit on your story. Sure. Uh, I feel like we're getting, we, we started with wanting to do a list of the uh, like metrics, but we're going in a totally different direction, which is fine. I just thought it was funny. Um, so with my progress within the, the fat loss uh, phase that I'm in right now. So I'm a week in and from a scale standpoint, we had a lot of success within week one. Uh, and rightfully so. I came to realize that from a nutritional standpoint that I was snacking a little bit more than I had been tracking. Um, I think that this is common for individuals who are in quite the surplus um, and they find themselves in a situation where they're like, all right, I have this much food. I had 600 carbs to eat on a day-to-day -day basis just for your reference. I had a lot of food to eat. So when my meal was heating up, we have a, if you guys have watched us on YouTube, we have a beautiful pantry and Sue keeps it stocked. I've got lots of snacks. I've got lots of options options of my favorite treats. So as my meal's heating up, 
oh yeah, I definitely reached back and got in there and got a couple snacks, snacked on those. I'd have a Nugo bar with my meal. Um, I'd have pop tarts potentially with my meal, just things that I'm grabbing and adding to this meal that's already pretty calorically dense. Um, and I'm realizing as I'm getting into this dieting phase that, man, I was eating even more than I had uh, thought. So we saw massive progress because one, the calorie deficit was even larger than what I had been reporting, but also I lost a lot of fluid and glycogen within the uh, muscle bellies. So within that, uh, the physique photos themselves didn't really represent that fat loss that I had seen or, or the scale weight that I had seen change. Uh, and the reason for that is because I didn't really lose body fat necessarily. I lost that glycogen and water that was stored intramuscularly. And so when I took physique photos, I was like, damn, bro, I do not look even as good as I did last week. I actually look worse. And the reality is, is that that's part of the game. I lost the the fullness to those muscles and I kept the body fat that I'm trying to remove. And so how I'm going to go about losing that body fat is just staying consistent. There's not a reason for me to change things. We didn't do anything wrong. We actually did things probably uh, too good just in terms of the, the weight that was lost. We're gonna have to bring food up just a little bit to keep me a little bit more uh, steadfast in, in the progress of the fat loss itself. But um, yeah, that's a, a very important piece as you're starting a dieting phase to understand that the physique photos are not always going to be perfectly representative of what you're seeing on the scale. And that can go both directions, whether it be the scale going up or that be the scale going down. And, and just another thing to be paying attention to when you're taking photos and assessing your progress. Yeah. And there's just different phases to each goal that you have. And within weight loss, you do have to lose the glycogen. You have to get flat to lose the fat. And so you can't look at one single picture or one single metric and say, this is what has happened. Because if Alex just looked at the scale weight, he'd say, oh my gosh, I had an incredibly successful week. And then if he just looked at pictures, he'd be like, oh my gosh, I need to cut my food more. And this diet isn't working and I'm hungry for no reason. Um, but if he's able to look at them together, plus the biofeedback markers, which um, I wanted to touch on for sleep, you had a few nights of not having great sleep at all. And then the huge, the biggest scale drop was after you had a really, really good night of sleep. And you're able to see a lot of that kind of swoosh off. And so being able to see what these metrics are. So if you are trying to see the scale go down or are trying to fight for fat loss, and then you're not getting that sleep, you're not only going to have those sleep goggles on, but you're actually going to reflect what that lack of sleep is. So going through the rest of this list to make sure <laughs> Alex is happy. Um, energy. And Alex mentioned energy early on as well. And that's going to be huge. So um, let's use a few client examples. I have clients come to me under eating all of the time or sporadic eating. They're very inconsistent of one day. They have 2000 calories. The next day they're having 1100 calories and it's kind of bouncing around or their meal timing is super inconsistent. And so I always love to point out any marker that they are progressing in. And so if they start to rate their energy better and better, that's a huge win that we want to see. And we want to be able to gauge that progress of, okay, how are, is my energy going throughout the day? Because when we look at energy, it's not just, oh, am I like bouncing off the walls and am I good to go? It's do I have the mental and physical energy to accomplish what I need to in a day and do I feel good about it? Because if we are in a place that the scale is going down and or up or whatever direction you want it to go, um, but your energy is not where you want it to be, then we do need to take a step back and look at that progress as a whole of what we're seeing and what we are, again, that end goal wanting to progress in. So um, we also mentioned endurance. So when we look at your training, this is why we highly encourage you to keep a training log. And if you want to learn more about a training log, we'll have two videos linked below me going through a training session and kind of talking through my training log. And then a sit down video of me talking about the important parts of a training log. And this is really helpful. So again, what gets measured gets managed. If you're going through your workouts, and you're not even first, if you're not progressing in your workouts, you should probably sign up for PDTC or a coach. Um, but if you're not progressing within your workouts or have progressions within your workouts, then you can go in and you feel really great one day, feel not so great because you don't really have a progression within your training and you don't have a goal that you're measuring and laying out. But it can also be 
um, when it comes to your training of just not making notes of how you are progressing. So if you don't track your weights, then it's really hard to see what you have progressed in. So for myself, I went many years without tracking my weights and then just expected myself to memorize every single weight I used. And that was at a time I also wasn't very progressive within my training of how it was written. But I just would be like, I think I did around 30s last time. I'm going to go ahead and grab these. And that not only wasted time in the gym of picking out my weight, but it also wasted progress that I could be seeing just by tracking those metrics. I will add for endurance, two big drivers within your training are going to be your nutrition. So how was your pre-workout meal? Are you having any intra carbs potentially? And then hydration. So hydration leading into the session as well as hydration during the session, because let's say that you are in Ohio and you are training in a garage. My, my scenario. <laughs> I pour sweat out there, especially in like a hypertrophy training or, or um, endurance-based training, I am pouring sweat. And so it's very, very important for me to one, have my pre-workout meal be very well salted, as well as having some salt within my water um, as my that I'm taking in during the training session to make sure that I stay hydrated. And if I don't do those things, I start to feel maybe a little bit of brain fog. I start to feel like my focus is is teetering uh, away from the training session, as well as just my ability to uh, last within uh, the set itself, as well as the entirety of the training session is lackluster. So those two things are, are massive when you're trying to assess from an endurance standpoint, of course, from a muscular endurance standpoint, repetitions and, and time trained and those things are obviously going to play a role but the things that are very much so within your control from a day-to-day -day standpoint is going to come down to your hydration and your nutrition tracking workouts for me has you know I, I for a long time since i really started like paying attention to my physique goals back in 2012 2013 i kept the one of the, the the best things that i did at that time was i worked at a gym at, a, at the time and I had, I saw a, a clipboard lying around and I'm like, I'm going to claim that clipboard as my clipboard now, because mm. that's what you do as a teenager. You're like, I see it. No one's using it. I think it's mine now. And so I saw it, I grabbed it. It's mine now. And I clipped my workouts to it. And because I worked at the gym, there was a little, you know, little cubby I could keep it in where I wouldn't lose it in my car, smash it in my gym bag, like you're an eighth grader putting his homework in his bag with no, no folders. Essentially, it's just like this crumpled up piece of paper that you get at the end of the day, when you get back to the gym and you're just like, I think this says 30. I, th I think this is my workout from last week. I can't really read it. Um, so I was really proud that I kept that. Uh, I grabbed that, I, I put my workouts on it. I kept that in a, in a safe uh, and protected place. And every workout I could go in, grab it and follow along and always progress upon in some way, shape or form what, what I was doing in that last session. Um, and so that was something I did from the very beginning. And we even did it when we first started lifting uh, with uh, athletics and sports and stuff. So that's something that was ingrained in us uh, early on was how to track progress, how to write things down, how to progressively overload those things. And it also kind of gets you out of your own way, right? And it, it kind of, eliminates your ability to not live up to what you did previously, right? And it's very easy, especially when you're, you know, like in a fat loss phase or something, or you're in a deficit and your, your energy, uh, not only in, in general, the way you feel, but also the energy you're taking in each day is less and less, right? You have, which makes sense, less energy. And there's only so much caffeine can sort of do in this situation, right? Because caffeine is sort of fake energy. It, does, it doesn't really contribute energy to you. It sort of just blocks things that make you tired. So at you know, there, there's sort of some self-sabotage there. If you're not eating enough uh, and you're over abusing caffeine, at some point that's going to run into itself and explode. Um, but tracking progress does allow you to, and using a training log does allow you to continually show up for yourself, continually uh, best what you were doing that week prior, or at least match it, right? Um, so as you're in a deficit, matching what you did in previous weeks in my book is a thumbs up. That's a progression, um, especially the deeper and deeper you get into a fat loss phase. Uh, but more recently, why I kind of brought this, all this up more recently, I got back. So I went on a hiatus from my logbook um, and got in sort of a training funk. And I'm like, why am I in a training funk? Like I, I want to 
I want to be excited to come. I want to be excited to go. This is this is who I am as a person. This is how I express myself. Like I want to be here. And I noticed, I was like, well, I haven't kept a logbook in a year. And I was like, what, what is going on here? And so I pulled my logbook out and over the past two, like this has been the best two weeks of training I've had in probably two or three years because I'm actually tracking my workouts, right? And that's coming from someone who's like pretty steadfast in this workout game and doesn't take any shit from himself, right? Like from himself, right? I, I, if I sort of start to bitch out a little bit, I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> that's not, we're not doing that, right? And I do that without the logbook. So the fact that I was doing, I was allowing myself to just slip up, right? I was allowing myself to sort of fall under, kind of like slip under the radar, right? It's like, if you're in a group setting, you're kind of always avoiding the personal trainer or the strength coach. You're just like, I'm gonna just keep out of his view and he's not gonna know that I didn't do all my four sets. The last set that he may signs off, maybe he signs off on, I only did two, but I'm like, no, this is my last set. And he wasn't watching me, so he doesn't know, right? And I was allowing myself to do that for years, right? And, and I, I think if you're someone who enjoys to train, regardless of if you're showing up for yourself and still training, that training isn't all that it could be, right? Even if, you know, we're not even talking about exercise selection, volume, we're not talking about any of that. We're just talking about beating yourself from that last session, or at least matching your efforts from that last session. Um, and, and keeping a logbook for me over the past two, couple of weeks, again, has been one of the biggest boosts to my training quality and performance and just enjoyment as a whole, uh, which I just took for granted, which was silly. But. Yeah, I love that. I will say um, that brought a favorite quote of mine from Ed Milet up. Um, he said, I don't want to misquote him. It is that you're not always going to achieve your goals, but you're always going to be reestablishing your standard. And so with that, it's one of those things that uh, like your standard has always been very, very high, but like some of those things just happen gradually over time. And then that's just resetting that standard, even though that you weren't necessarily going for a goal, the standard is always being reestablished. And that's one quote that always is like going through my mind more so. Um, and I think that it's a really you know, powerful quote. If you, I don't know if he's the originator of it, but that's who I heard say mm -hmm. it, but yeah. yeah, I really like that quote. And I think it speaks to the fact that your goals, like we talked about in the last podcast episode, your goals can be ever changing. Um, and there's times that you have to let go, so to speak, of a goal to be able to accomplish a goal that makes more sense or is going to serve you more. And being able to kind of rededicate or reestablish what that baseline, what that standard is, is, is so powerful because it gives you clarity as you move forward. And that's something I've mentioned throughout this podcast is having clarity on what your goal is so you even know how to read these metrics to gauge your progress truly because for different people with different goals the way that you gauge these things that we're talking about is going to be vastly different and that's really important to understand and to take forward with yourself is I need to establish what my goal is or where I want to see this metric change so that I can understand how that fits into my goal or how that's working towards my goal. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. So some other biofeedback markers that we take a look at or ones that are going to be really helpful to be able to progress in is going to be digestion. So this is one, again, that I talk about with my clients a lot, and they might be in a place that they are not seeing the changes that they necessarily want within their physique or the scale isn't moving where they want it to go, but we're able to see incredible change with their posture, with their digestion, and with their core control. And so those are all really important to be able to see that other change that they're wanting to see, again, that's going to be scaled differently for each person of what that priority list is. But being able to see that digestion improve is absolutely ginormous because you're not just you are what you eat, but you are what you digest. And being able to have a digestive, digestive system that's running properly is going to help you in so many ways because I know any of my other hot girl stomach problems girls out there 
or guys, you know that when you're not having a good stomach digestion day, that can affect your mindset, your mentality. It can make your you feel like you have brain fog because there is the gut-brain axis. There is going to be a lot of other factors involved in that just outside of am I digesting my food well or do I feel good? And so being able to see that improve is huge and really important to be able to see as a metric, as well as things like your heart rate. So um, when we talk about tracking workouts, heart rate is something that I often track, not only my resting heart rate to see how that improves um, throughout different times in my life based on what stress that I'm under. So being able to see a a resting heart rate um, in the 40s is really great for me with the amount of stress that I'm under. That's a huge progress marker that I look at, as well as being able to see where my heart rate is during different cardio. So throughout this past prep, being able to see my heart rate improve and gain more endurance was a huge win for me um, to just see that progress moving forward and to be able to take into consideration like that was a win in and of itself. Um, Not that I burned a certain amount of calories during that cardio session or whatever it may be, It was the fact of, oh, I was able to maintain a lower heart rate during that, which means my cardiovascular health is improving. And that's a huge thing that I want to be able to progress in. I agree. And I think that with heart rate also comes stress. And so or you, when you're tracking heart rate, you're also um, looking at it from a, a stress perspective. And stress is going to obviously play a big role. It's not just simply the stress that we put on ourselves from a training standpoint, but of course, life stress and those different factors need to be taken into the equation. I know that many individuals uh, who are chronic hard workers who are individuals that just continue to push to rise to the occasion and push everything to the side. Nothing stops me. I can get through everything. I appreciate you. I appreciate your work ethic. I think that it is admirable. Um, And I'm also speaking to myself here because I, I fall into this category as well, is that there are going to be times where you have to give yourself grace. And, and there are things in your life that are going to be taking a greater priority that maybe you have to miss a training session one day. I know it sounds crazy. And it's like, there's not a single thing in this world that would stop me from getting a training session in. I can assure you there are things that you need to give yourself grace on and be able to move on and get the session done the next day and prioritize the things that are at hand, especially when it comes to maybe some of these biofeedback markers that we're speaking to are all in the can. Your sleep is a zero, your energy is a zero, all these different factors. It's probably a good opportunity for you to not take that training session on and live to fight another day. And I think that that's going to be something that you have to be very cognizant cognizant of when you're assessing your progress and and those things. And we even were just talking about that for Alex the other day of um, he he was supposed to train and then he came to me. He's like, I'm not training today. I either just need a walk. I need to prioritize sleep. And I congratulated him. I was like, that's a huge step for you where someone else might think that was a failure of not training and past Alex would have thought. Yeah, I, st- I still think that sometimes. Yes, he sometimes does. I think that, but you, you find you have to you have to fight to find the middle ground to it. There's going to be scenarios where it's like, eh, I, in in hindsight, I probably should have trained that day. I wasn't in as bad of shape as I was thinking I was in. And then there's definitely going to be times where you do go and train, and after the fact, you're like, mm, it would probably have been best for me to not get that session in and get more rest or go on a walk or something like that. So it's not going to be a hundred percent of the time you nail it. And I think that accepting that is going to be a very important piece of finding that gauge because as you make those decisions, you're going to have more repetitions and just get better at understanding your body and how you feel and what's going to be best for you. Um, So it's more so of just getting more reps, I think is big. Mm -hmm. Do do you think it's fair to say within that uh, framework a little bit, just for the listeners here, um, if you're someone, if you're someone that gets your workout in consistently five or six days out of the week, and like, that's your thought, that you had, you're like, I probably shouldn't train today. That that's not going to help my cause because, because you're consistently training five, you know, four or five days a week. Right. Um, but for someone who consistently trains four or five times a month or Mm -hmm. four or five times a year, well, not training probably isn't the answer for you. Right. In that scenario. And and again, like that is completely con- contextual to the individual. And I, I think that's very important to mention. But I think it that decision should be dictated upon what you're consistently doing week in and week out, uh, not just like that moment of like, oh, 
well, I was going to train, but I know I haven't trained in six months, but <laughs> kind of stressed out. So probably yeah. shouldn't train. Bummer. And it's like, no, you probably should actually train. Yeah. And, you know, so I, I think it's contextual to the situation. And, and if you if you've been someone as consistent, you know, as Alex or Sue, um, you know, or, or myself over the long haul of, you know, my lifting career, it's like, maybe that's a good decision to not train based off of every other thing that you've kind of been considering or thinking about, or your body's been telling you, right? Because your physiology doesn't care about your professional goals, right? And if you don't take care of your physiology, your professional goals are going to always suffer it, especially in the long term, right? You can fight through short term suck, right? You can fight through a year, you can fight through maybe two years of just burying yourself into the ground, but we can all here in, in this conversation very realistically share stories of allowing our, allowing ourselves, allowing our brain essentially to bury our physiology, our physical health into the ground. I know I can for myself. And although that was great in the short term of professional growth or gain or whatever, those metrics, it came to a screeching halt, right? And that to me, that screeching halt has been way worse than if I would just had taken care of my physical health, my physiology before and anything else, right? Because it, you have it in your head, you know, that fighting through and like digging deep is and, and bearing yourself physically is the end all be all to that professional goal, right? And it for a lot of people and for a lot of situations, that's true. But I think it's important to understand that that's true only in the short term. And you have to create constraints around the amount of that you're willing to give in any given moment, right? So it's like, okay, I know this week's going to be a lot. I'm committing to this and I'm, I'm creating a constraint. If this lasts more than a week, I got to create better boundaries around this thing. If I'm not, if this continues, I got, I just got to create better boundaries. That's more representative of the, the lack of boundaries and constraints that I was able to set, right? Or, you know, you're like, all right, we got to dig deep for seven days because I have a deadline. And then I know on the other side of that, I'm going to allow myself to relax, return back to baseline, return back to homeostasis, and I'm good, right? Those are two different situations completely, right? Yeah. Um, and, and largely based off of boundaries and constraints that you give yourself, right? And I, I, I think I want to repeat this. Your physiology does not care about your professional goals. And if you do not take care of your physiology, your professional goals will suffer in the long term right? Because you can't, you just can't do it long-term, right? And long-term is, is contextual to each individual. Some people I think can grind through a year, can grind through two years, right? And some people get hit with a really hard month and their whole physiology shuts down, right? So it's like, it, it is contextual to the individual, but I truly think that is uh, a very important thing to, to understand, especially in this hustle culture is, you know, your physiology isn't, hasn't evolved or is not in a position to properly manage everything that our our ambitions and our outside influences are asking of us every single day right and you have to if you if you want to run this marathon of success in life you got to pace yourself right you can't just start out at a dead sprint and expect yourself to finish right you're like you're dead to the world and you're like i got 20 miles <laughs> left so hope this yeah. goes well <laughs> you're gonna be you're gonna be pooping yourself and crawling the, those 20 miles <laughs> rather than coasting you know at, at a steady yeah. jog so understand that yeah and if you're listening to this and you're thinking oh my gosh i haven't taken any of this into consideration or i have so many wins or so much progress that i've seen that i haven't thought about that was the point is to get you thinking outside of just the scale or just outside of pictures outside of i am this size within clothing and being able to take into consideration what your end goal is or what your goal is within the time frame that you're looking at and how you're tracking different metrics and being able to see what the 
those improvements are bringing. And even for myself, the improvements that I see, and I've gotten so much better. I wasn't great at it. And like Alex said, you need reps to understand and to even extend that grace and understand what that grace means to you as a human. You need reps of extending that grace to even be able to like take that fully in. So yesterday was a day of a lot of improvements for me of I felt like I had really great sleep and I prioritized getting to sleep at a good time. I also was able to have a really productive morning and even with running errands and a few other things that normally would have thrown me off my like mental game, I was able to zone in and accomplish those goals. And that was a huge win for me of how I handled yesterday and how I was able to show up for myself. And even that walk that I mentioned at the end of the day was another way I was really showing up for myself. And that was progress. Did I see the scale go a certain way or did I see my pictures drastically change or anything like that. No, but I saw progress that was really important for my goals right now and what that progress is moving forward. So you can even take a look at things like your ease of movement or how easy it is to do something, your habits, and even looking at how easy it is to implement your habits or you see yourself talking yourself into a habit instead of talking yourself out of it. Being able to see your skin improve is going to be um, another metric here. How your clothes fit, your sex drive, and different health markers are all extremely important. And the reason I keep using the word important is because I have to shed the light, just like Alex talked about with his client earlier, shed the light to a lot of clients of the progress that they are making because it's so simple when we look at fitness goals to only look at those those metrics that everyone knows or we've been taught to of what the scale says. But it's so much more important as a whole to take a look at what progress you're seeing, not only for your mental side of being able to appreciate what you've accomplished and continue moving forward. Because if you feel like you're not making progress, it can just be how you're looking at progress and that's stopping your mentality from allowing you to truly see that progress forward. So being able to take all of these into consideration and hopes that you're maybe a little bit kinder to yourself, you celebrate yourself, but you also freaking push your yourself when you need to and you recognize you're not standing up for yourself, your body, your health, your mental health when you need to. So this definitely isn't a feel good, you're making a lot of progress, don't worry about anything else. It's you're making progress. I'm sure there's still areas you need to improve on, but you need to be aware of what those areas are and being able to see that there's more than just one. I will add for the the dudes out there that are in a fat loss phase and um, you love how your your clothes fit when you're a little bit heavier, the sleeves fit a little bit tighter, the chest is a little bit tighter, the back is a little bit tighter. And then as you start to lose weight, those sleeves start to have a little bit of a, a gap. Don't get discouraged. <laughs> Stick with it. This is what's supposed to happen. Um, I know that even even myself and, and a lot of the, the male clients that I work with, as we go through dieting phases, their clothes start to feel a little bit looser. And some of the, the women or men who are listening, they're like, that's what I want to happen. I want my clothes to fit a little bit looser. But there is a, a portion of, of men and potentially women as well, that as soon as those the the tops or or the the shorts that they're wearing feel like they have a little bit of a, a gap where it used to be pretty snug, they get a little bit uh, been out of shape or like, eh, I think we need to pull back the reins. I think I need to add a little bit more weight. I, I'm not happy with how I feel here. Push through that. That's you know part of the process. We talked about the glycogen and, and, and water loss that's going to be coming out of the muscle bellies as you lose body fat. Um, and yeah, I, I know that for me, that's one of the things that as I'm in the early stages of fat loss that I'm like, I don't know, dude, I think we need to stop this. And I'm good with just being a little bit uh, have more heavy and, and carrying a little bit more body fat if my shirts fit the certain way that I like them to and that kind of thing. Um, but it'll be better for me to, to lose the body fat. Yeah. And that's, again, another form of progress of not jumping goals back and forth or not psyching himself out because of the goal that he has right now of understanding that it's not always going to be linear, but there's going to be trends that we want to see. So with fat loss, you're not going to each time you take pictures or each time that you assess progress, it's not always going to be exactly what you want to see, but there should be that trend in whatever direction that you're going and taking that into consideration. So huge progress win for you there as well. Yeah. And I would say that also, I mean, I, I have a coach throughout this dieting phase. I work with Adam Miller from N1 Education and I have worked with 
hun- hundreds, if not thousands of individuals over the last uh, near decade. And I have lost a lot of body fat. I have gained a lot of muscle with all those individuals, but I still feel that it's necessary to have the accountability as well as the knowledge of someone else taking care of those things uh, to get me to the, the goal that I have, because it would be very easy for me to start a dieting phase myself and then my shirt fit a little bit looser and be like, ah, I need some refeeds. I need to fill back out. I need to have more food. It would be very easy for me to, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I, to make that make sense in my mind mm-hmm. more so. Uh, when it, justify. Yeah, rationalize, justify. justify. And the reality is, is that I definitely do not need that, but my mind could definitely play tricks on me in that scenario, especially after looking at the uh, fresh physique photos. I could have very much so said, I need about a 400 carb refeed today, probably for three days straight. Um, and that would very much so hinder my progress. Cam confirmed that even during prep, when I just literally felt like I, my body was doing everything that it could and it was doing so much, I would take my pictures, send them to Alex, and I'd be like, I'm definitely getting a refeed. It looks like I need it. <laughs> and then he would like lower food or cardio. And I'm like, ugh, here I am as a coach, just seeing my body and again, justifying or rationalizing it. Um, so it can, it is not can be, it is extremely helpful to have a coach just to be able to have that structure towards your goal because you can't expect yourself to be perfect or to be perfectly objective or perfectly understand everything. So being able to understand that you don't understand everything will get you a lot closer to your goals than assuming or thinking that you understand everything. And uh, the secret sauce of Alex's playbook he's not telling you is that he just buys smaller shirts. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I wanted to, I I wanted to, um, I wrote something down earlier that I wanted to share just as a closing thought of my own, just to leave people with this uh, here today. Your decisions today lead to your starting position tomorrow. And I think that is, you know, regardless of whatever goals you're working towards, uh, whatever your daily actions are towards those goals, um, understand that your decisions today will lead to your starting position tomorrow. So if you want a good starting position for tomorrow and you know, I, I I have a lot of friends who, you know, are potentially trying to get away from uh, alcohol or, or other substances, or are trying to make better decisions with their food, or trying to make better decisions with their their health and and their fitness or whatever. Everything that like it always comes back to. I honestly just enjoy feeling better or good when I wake up, right? And so it's like you have the you have the the autonomy, right? Exhaustion, I think, is a part of life. Like we're all, everyone in their own way is is exhausted, right? And there's a certain level of exhaustion that I carry, that these guys carry, that, you know, a single mom, like, you know, everyone's got their own levels of exhaustion that they're dealing with or carrying. But those decisions that fall or lie in between are so important for dictating where you're going to start in the race tomorrow. Right, so if you're someone who just wants to f- just feel like they have a fair shot and a fair starting place tomorrow, then make sure your decisions today reflect that. Okay, and I, I just wanted to leave that with you guys today as we finish up today's episode. Yeah, I love that. So thanks so much for joining us and we will catch you in the next one. Make sure you're subscribed. Okay, bye. <laughs>